Hi, welcome to this worship service. I trust that God will meet you as you watch and pray with us. Just a few announcements as we get started. We're already looking forward to our next outdoor worship service on the first Sunday of March. Word's getting out that it's a great experience. It's good to be together and folks feel comfortable being outdoors, physically distanced or even warm and cozy in their cars. In March, we plan to move to two outdoor worship services a month and of course we'll continue to worship online every Sunday. On March 7th, we invite you to bring toilet paper, diapers, and wipes for Your Belinda Food for Families, the food pantry we've supported for years now. The pantry's seen a huge increase in need from our neighbors, and they've done a marvelous job of ramping up to make sure they have enough to meet that need. Members of our church who volunteer there tell us that the toilet paper the pantry distributes is a precious commodity for the people they serve and in something the pantry's other sources don't provide. That makes our donations so very important. They depend on us to keep up those supplies. So in a couple weeks, when you come to church for worship, we'll have a table set up to receive your donations, and we'll make sure they get to the food pantry right away. That same weekend, we'll be hosting our Youth Ministry Spiritual Formation Summit, and I want to make sure that's on everybody's radar. It's a process where we gather together to define what we want our youth to have in their spiritual backpacks when we launch them into adulthood. It's an incredibly important process. We'll begin the conversation Thursday night, March 4th, with our teens, a special Zoom conversation just for them. On Friday, March 5th, we'll meet again by Zoom and our parents and anyone else in the congregation who are invested in our youth, past, present, or future, are invited to attend. Saturday and Sunday, our renovation team and staff will take all that information and turn it into a document that will guide our ministry for generations to come. Everyone in the congregation is welcome and encouraged to participate in this process. Our blood drive this last Monday was wonderfully successful. With a full schedule of appointments, the Red Cross collected 19 pints of blood, including four first-time donors. Thanks to Betty Lee for coordinating this effort and for all the other volunteers of our church who were there to offer hospitality to the folks from our community who came to our campus to participate in this worthy effort. Well done. I also want to celebrate the generosity we've seen from the congregation since our annual meeting a couple weeks ago. Several folks have already increased their pledges and many people sent in a donation to go toward our operating expenses. Thank you. You'll be hearing more in the weeks to come about opportunities to share in this good work. And if you're considering making a special gift, I'd love to talk with you about the ways we can make the most of your generosity. You can call or send me an email or contact me through the church office. As Christians, we believe that God is present with us all the time. But the busyness and distractions in our lives often make it difficult for us to appreciate God's nearness. One of the rewards we hope to gain from our Lenten practices is an increased ability to quiet the noise in our lives so that we can be open to God's presence. So settle in, find a quiet focus, and open your spirit. Because wherever we are, whatever we're facing, God meets us. God meets us in the night, before the sun rises, before the wound heals, before there are answers, before there is closure. God meets us in the light, where joy is effervescent, where laughter is contagious, where flowers bloom from cracks in the sidewalk, and where people gather around the table. God meets us at the threshold at the edge of the water, 
at the beginning of the wilderness, at the start of something new, at the edge of faith. And if God meets us in all those places, then surely God meets us in between, staying with us through the wilderness. We are not alone. God is all around. Let us worship the God of the here and the now. Again and again, God meets us where we are. God's love knows no bounds, which is hard for us to understand and easy for us to forget. Therefore, in confession, we remember together that we are not alone. And in a unified voice, we once again ask for God's grace in that holy reminder. Family of faith, please pray with me. God, who meets us where we are, there is nowhere we can go that you are not. You were with Jesus at his baptism. You were with him in the wilderness. And even in between, you were there, saying aloud, this is my beloved. We know that you are with us too, in the good, the bad, and everything in between. But so often we act like we are alone. Instead of coming to you with our hurt, we hold it in or cast it onto others. Instead of coming to you with our joy, we credit ourselves and offer you nothing. How can we long for a deeper relationship with you while living like you are nowhere to be found? Forgive us our self-centered ways. Remind us that in every breath, in every step, you are there. You are the God who meets us where we are before and behind, above and below, within and around. Amen. Make us turn to you, God of love and compassion. Bring us home to
family of faith, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. God is here. God sees you. God knows you. God meets you at the edge of every new beginning. And God calls you beloved. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Good morning, children of God. Have you ever tried something new that was hard at first? Recently, I had some work done at my house. I had new baseboards and crown molding put up in my boys' rooms, and it needed to be painted. Now, I've done lots of painting before, so I thought it would be no problem to do it myself. Well, I was wrong. My first attempt was disastrous. I had paint dripping on my new floors. It was all over me, on the walls. It was just a mess. I thought it was going to be a simple job, but it wasn't. I considered giving up and hiring someone. But then I got some advice from a couple of friends, and it turns out that their tips and tricks worked and I was able to get the job done. It really helped to have someone alongside me as I was learning this new skill. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and Lent is a season when we think about what we can do to be better people and follow Jesus. Sometimes we even give up something or start doing something new that will help us to follow Jesus more closely. Starting something new can be scary or hard like my painting job, but we don't do it alone. God is with us. God doesn't wait for us to be perfect and get it all right, but meets us right where we are again and again. When Jesus started telling the good news that heaven was near, God was there from the beginning. God was there when Jesus was baptized. God was there when Jesus was in the wilderness. And God was there when Jesus started his ministry. And God is with us too, no matter where we are in our lives. So remember that during your Lenten journey. And all God's children say, Amen. Listen to God's word to you from Mark chapter one. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, if I'm honest, faith often feels like water in my hands. No matter how hard I try to hold on to it, some of it always slips through. Like droplets of truth running down my wrists back toward my heart. This human inability to hold on to you leaves me thirsty for more. So as we draw near to your word, I pray that once again you would meet us here. Meet us in our hope and our heartache. Meet us in our fear and our joy. Meet us in our cupped hands and in our clenched fists. And even if the water keeps running and we do not have a sky parting moment of clarity or a tangible sense that you are near, even if we do not hear the words, this is my beloved ringing in our ears, we will trust that you are near, always and forever meeting us here, running toward our hearts. Gratefully we pray. Amen. 
As we've been working with the resources that support our Lenten worship this year, Kim, Janet, and I have had some great conversations about the ampersand logo you see in the graphics for our online worship, on our prayer wall, and on the devotional prayer cards and journals that were available on Ash Wednesday. If you'd like some more, some of your own, just let us know. First of all, we had to learn how to pronounce it, ampersand. I've been practicing. Kim and I laughed as we confessed to each other that after taking a closer look at the spelling of the word, we realized that we'd been saying it wrong for most of our lives, and each one of us were mispronouncing it in a different way. <laughs> it turns out that swooping, swirling symbol has an ancient and interesting history, and over the years it's morphed into other symbols as well. It was first seen in graffiti in Pompeii. That city was destroyed by a volcanic eruption, covered in ash and pumice, and yet you can visit it today and learn what life was like almost 2,000 years ago. It's a glimmer, a, a subtle hint of God's resurrection power, revealing life even through death. We talked about that rhythm of faith on Ash Wednesday. I asked Janet about the similarity the ampersand symbol has to the treble clef we see at the beginning of a staff in a printed piece of music. She helped me understand that it orients the musician to the pitch represented by the notes that follow. It helps you locate middle C. And once you know that, everything else falls into place. Not only does it orient the individual musician, a singer, a flautist, a trumpeter, trombonist, or pianist, but it helps ensure that when they play together, their notes blend and harmonize as they should. The clefs orient musicians to their common notes, making sure they're all on the same page, musically speaking. Even though each one is looking at different sheets of music with different musical notations, the symbol is the key that orients them to play the right notes and ensures that the music the group makes together is cohesive and beautiful instead of a chaotic racket. As fascinating as the history and evolution of that little symbol may or may not be, for most of us, the ampersand is just a shortcut for the word and. The tiny word in the middle of our theme for this Lenten season, again and again. So much to reflect on in just this one little symbol. The ampersand swirls and loops back in on itself, reminding us of the cycles of our own growth in faith. We repeat past mistakes. We return to questions about God we've wondered about before, covering familiar territory that can trap us in old wounds or ground us in eternal truths. Again and again, we confront the reality of our fallen human nature. Again and again, we are met by God's grace and mercy. And now we're ready to look at the text for today. Mark's telling of the story of Jesus is stripped down to just the essentials. Today's passage is more a group of bullet points than an actual narration of events. Three major milestones in Jesus' life are checked off in just a few verses. Jesus is baptized, he's tested by Satan in the wilderness, and he begins his public ministry. And in each one, we see God meets Jesus with grace in a moment or a place of crisis. It's a pattern we'll see in our own faith again and again. We begin with Jesus' baptism, an event we considered on its own just a few weeks ago. 
Jesus comes to the edge of the River Jordan, stepping into its waters to be baptized by John. As the Holy Spirit falls on him, Jesus hears God's words of blessing. You are my son, my beloved one. I am very pleased with you. God meets Jesus in words of grace, identity, and affirmation. But that warm, fuzzy presence of God is balanced with another more disconcerting sign of God's presence. Mark tells us that the heavens were torn apart, split open. This isn't a gentle parting of the clouds so that a ray of sunshine can shine through. It's ripping, tearing, it's violent. God has broken through the protective barriers that kept God contained in heaven. Unwilling to be confined to sacred spaces, God is now on the loose in our world. It's a little frightening when you think about it. With barely a moment to catch his breath and dry off his beard after his baptism, the Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. Mark doesn't give us any details at all about Jesus' encounter with Satan, but he does hint at what was happening on the sidelines. Again, we see images of grace and images of danger. We see God's grace in the angels there serving Jesus, tending to his needs as he endured a challenge we can only imagine but wild beasts were there too. One of the many dangers of the wilderness were ravenous predators looking for their next meal, and they were a danger to people too. This odd detail Mark includes can be a callback to Isaiah 35 verses 8 to 10, which promises a safe highway for God's people as they travel home to Israel. The dangers in the wilderness are still there, but God's people will be protected. The account of Jesus testing in the wilderness doesn't conclude so much as Mark just moves on to what's next. Jesus is back in Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The kingdom of God has drawn near. That kingdom isn't a place, but a power. It's God's energetic capacity to put right all that is wrong in this world. Jesus himself demonstrates what this capacity looks like through his actions and his words. Through Jesus Christ, God's power and grace have set that kingdom into motion. This is good news But don't miss the ripple of danger that shows up in this part of the story. Jesus' proclamation begins after John was arrested by Herod. John the Baptist's call to repentance got him sideways with King Herod with deadly consequence. And we'll see by the time Lent concludes, and as we walk through Mark's gospel from now through November, Jesus' way of living out his purpose is dangerous too. What Jesus is beginning is the transformation of the world. And that's why those in charge of the world as it was end up killing him. At the edge of the Jordan River and the parched Judean wilderness, In Galilee, at the start of his ministry of proclamation, Jesus shows us that God meets us with grace. God meets us at the water's edge, in the liminal spaces, on the verge of something new. Again and again, God meets us, declaring us precious and dearly loved ministering to us when we face a time of trial, proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God is near. 
This is the rhythm of our faith. This is an eternal truth we can return to again and again. As Christians, we follow Jesus. His life shows us the rhythms and patterns we can expect in our own walk of faith. And the journey of faith that we begin in baptism, one that is faithfully pursued, will take us through the wilderness. Drawing near to God's power, God's sky-ripping power, is a dangerous thing. And the world is filled with wild beasts of one sort or another, and with those who would oppose what God is doing in the world with everything in their power. If we think being a Christian guarantees a life of comfort and ease, we have misunderstood the message of the gospel. Jesus was clear in his proclamation, repent and believe the good news. When we repent, we reorient the direction of our lives so that our thoughts, words, and actions line up with God's will. That can be a painful process, but it is necessary if we are to follow Christ. Jesus' call to believe the good news isn't so much about an intellectual assent to theological propositions. It's not nearly as heady as all that. Believing the good news is not about what we know or understand. It's more about trusting ourselves to God's care. It's about promising to follow where God leads, living the days God has given us as best we can, trusting that God is with us and that we are held in God's hands no matter what dangers we face. The way of Jesus leads to the cross, but it doesn't end there. It ends at Easter where we learn again and again that death doesn't have the last word. It never has. Again and again, we remember that the God of resurrection life meets us and nothing can separate us from God's love. That is the foundation of the gospel, the eternal truth that grounds us. It's the middle C that orients our lives, that gets us on the same page and turns the individual lives we lead into a beautiful symphony of praise and ministry. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And as you go, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. Amen.